The first carrier Yorktown who fought the war's most crucial sea battles, vastly outnumbered by a huge Imperial Navy. After she was sunk, a second Yorktown took up that great name to fight across the Pacific. It takes a certain kind of ship, a certain kind of man, to stand up to bombs, torpedoes, and kamikazes day after day and keep coming back to win. On June 6, 1942, Tanabe Yahachi, commanding Imperial Navy submarine I-168, is stalking a crippled United States aircraft carrier, USS Yorktown. He wants revenge for losses inflicted by Yorktown and her sister carriers on the Japanese in the Battle of Midway, fought two days earlier. Tanabe fires one of the most devastating four torpedo spreads of the war. He stays at periscope depth long enough to watch the explosions tear into Yorktown. Watching his ship go down, Yorktown skipper Elliot Buckmaster makes his surviving crew a promise. That's all right, fellas. We'll get another ship and come out again. The first carrier Yorktown was a stepchild of two things, the Great Depression and fascism. President Franklin D. Roosevelt confronted both threats with one stroke. As part of the National Industrial Recovery Act, $238 million was set aside to build naval ships. The 38 million was for these two aircraft carriers, the Yorktown and for the Enterprise, and the building process began at Newport News. Being the class leader, Yorktown was built first. President Roosevelt's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, was chosen to christen the ship. Yorktown launches on April 4th, 1936. Designated as CV-5, the fifth of a young United States carrier force, she is designed to incorporate all the experience and lessons learned from operations of the first four carriers. At 19,800 tons, Yorktown is barely two-thirds the displacement of the upcoming Essex class. Her 827-foot, six-inch length accommodates some 80 planes divided among fighters and torpedo and dive bomber squadrons. Yorktown's 32.5 knot speed allows her to outrace submarines and spearhead fast-moving sea battles. Her peacetime complement of 2,217 men will rise to nearly 3,000 in war. Through the late 30s, Yorktown is part of fleet war games. She is working out new tactics for aircraft carriers that up to now have been seen mostly as subordinate to the needs of the battleship line. In this period, there was a photo op, and it had the Enterprise, the Yorktown, the Ranger, and the Lexington in line. All they were doing was coming back to base after a fleet exercise. But that picture is what influenced some of the Japanese naval aviators to think about combining carriers as an independent strike force rather than to have it as was still the practice with both the British and uh, with the United States Navy of having the carriers basically there to defend the battle line or the battleships. When Hitler overruns Northern Europe in the spring of 1940, Yorktown transfers back to the Atlantic for neutrality patrols. 
Her planes are to hunt U-boats and surface raiders and alert British convoys, although they are not to attack the Germans. Yorktown is refitting in Norfolk, Virginia, when the news comes that the main battle line of the United States fleet has been annihilated at Pearl Harbor. Yorktown races through the Panama Canal to join Lexington, Enterprise, and Saratoga, already in the Pacific. The orders from Washington, from Admiral King, were that number one, we need to use the carriers. We need to keep them busy. Number two, we need to keep the Japanese off guard. Number three, we need to raise morale. To accomplish that, Yorktown and her sisters make pinprick raids on the Japanese occupied Marshall and Gilbert Islands. Doing little damage, but suffering little, because the Japanese have not yet installed major defenses. But Yorktown's air groups find out quickly that some of their best planes are inferior to first-line enemy aircraft. The fastest Navy fighter, the Wildcat, has trouble catching up with Japanese dive bombers and torpedo planes, much less the speedy Zero fighter. In early May of 1942, the Japanese rushed to consolidate their string of conquests. They sent an invasion force through the Coral Sea, aimed at Port Moresby the last stronghold of the Allies on New Guinea. Alerted through broken codes, the U.S. Navy moves to intercept. The American force of two flat tops, Yorktown and Lexington, is protected by eight cruisers and 13 destroyers. It has to stop enemy invasion transports escorted by three carriers, eight cruisers, and 15 destroyers. First, there's an invasion group which has the transports to carry the force to take Port Moresby. And they're covered by a light aircraft carrier, the Shoho. There's then also a striking force, which is made up of two heavy carriers, Shokaku and Zuikaku, both uh, Pearl Harbor raiders. Yorktown is the flagship of Rear Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher. He takes his carrier into her first major battle. On May 4th, Yorktown planes find Japanese ships at Tulagi and sink the destroyer Kikazuki and three minesweepers. but the main forces have not made contact. They are looking for each other on the 5th, and both sides are surprised on the 6th not to find each other. But on the 7th, they do. Japanese Aramata is flying toward our ships. Our planes are flying toward the Japanese ships. They actually pass in the air and from altitude, both fleets can be seen. Although the American and Japanese fleets never see each other on May 7th, both are now vulnerable to attack from the opposing airborne squadrons. The American pilots strike first. Planes from both Yorktown and Lexington attack and sink the enemy carrier Shoho. Lieutenant Commander R.E. Dixon radios what will become an historic message. Scratch one flat top. American pilots managed to get some bombs on the deck of the Shokaku. That puts her out of action. The next day, May 8th, planes from the Japanese carriers find the Lexington and Yorktown operating fairly close together. 
but not in such a way that the combat air patrol can cover both of them. And in fact, we're still trying to operate at that time with 18 fighters as the normal complement aboard an American aircraft carrier. Way too few. Captain Elliot Buckmaster skillfully uses Yorktown's high speed and agility, narrowing his target profile by spinning his 827-foot ship from broadside to stern on to approaching aerial torpedoes. Over half a dozen Japanese fish and as many bombs go wide of their twisting target. But the bigger, older Lexington can't maneuver like the new and agile Yorktown. And the Lady Lex pays the price. The Lexington takes a total of five bombs and torpedoes. And she goes dead in the water. Internal fires and explosions set off by gasoline vapors finally doom Lexington. Yorktown fights as the lone U.S. carrier. Yorktown is hit by one bomb, which hits the flight deck, goes on down, explodes on the fourth deck. But the damage to the Yorktown is minimal. She's torn up pretty good inside, but again, nothing vital. A near miss lands close enough to the Yorktown that it opens the hull. In the final analysis, what we have is a tactical victory for the Japanese. They have sunk one of our major fleet carriers against only the loss of one light carrier. But not having sufficient cover in the air, it's felt that they've got to postpone. That's the Japanese word for it, not, not quit, but postpone the invasion of Port Moresby. They turn around and head back then to their bases. Yorktown is damaged. Uh, she is ordered to make her way back to Pearl. And all the way back, Yorktown will leave a trail of oil. This is about the same time Admiral Nimitz sent the order out to the Enterprise and Hornet to expedite to get back to Pearl Harbor as quick as possible. They know that the Japanese are coming. They've broken the code. They know that there's going to be a major push against Midway. Admiral Nimitz sends every available plane that he can find to Midway to augment the forces that are already there. There's a real question in his mind as to whether the damaged Yorktown can be repaired in enough time for her to get into the battle or not. Everybody knows that weeks of required repairs on Yorktown can never be crammed into three days, but Nimitz orders, do it. Under the eyes of Pacific Fleet Commander Chester Nimitz, repair crews go round the clock in the first days of June 1942 to repair the battle-damaged Yorktown well enough to meet the approaching Japanese advance on Midway. And Nimitz makes no bones about it. He tells the people that repair the ships, he said, I know that this is a job that should take a couple of months. You've got three days. He said, I want this ship back in three days. They were ordered to, if they could patch, patch the hole with a oak plug to plug it. If they couldn't patch the hole with an oak plug to weld it close. When Yorktown pulls out of the harbor to head toward Midway, they're still working on her. To guarantee the success of their invasion, the Japanese feel they must first eliminate the threat of land-based aircraft. But a first strike from their carriers against Midway's air installations is harassed enough by the island's defenses to leave the mission incomplete. The Imperial commanders order their carriers to prepare a second strike.
Waiting for the approach of the Japanese in the open ocean north of Midway, Yorktown's pilots get a blunt briefing. If only three out of your 12 plane squadron survive the run-in to deliver torpedoes, you will have accomplished your mission. The torpedo planes face miserable odds. The pilots must use suicidal dropping techniques to deliver torpedoes so poorly manufactured, they often fail to work. They had to slow down to 90 miles an hour and get practically right down within 100 feet of the water to drop that torpedo. If they dropped it any higher or at any greater speed, the torpedo would disintegrate when it hit the water. The torpedo planes from the Hornet go in first. They find the Japanese fleet. There are 15 TBDs. They line up to attack the Japanese carriers. And of course, the Zeros come down on them. They shoot down all 15 torpedo planes. Torpedo 8 is, is destroyed. Then comes the Enterprise torpedo planes. There are 14 of them. They run into exactly the same situation. Only four of them will get back to the Enterprise. There are 12 TBDs that come in with the, the Yorktown attack. 10 of them are shot down. But just as the last of the torpedo planes make their run, Yorktown's dive bombers arrive. One squadron is coming down from the Yorktown. It catches the carrier Soryu, and all four of these Japanese carriers are veterans of Pearl Harbor. They come down on the Soryu, and in just a matter of seconds, she's burning from one end to the other. There were no Japanese fighters left. They were all chasing after the TBDs. At the same moment, the Enterprise SBDs have arrived. One squadron destroys the Akagi, which is the flagship, both at Pearl Harbor and at Midway. The other places bombs on the Kaga. The Hiryu, the fourth carrier, is lagging behind. She's spotted by some of the pilots on the way out, but she's far enough away from the other three that she's not attacked. The Yorktown planes turn and they head back. They just barely get back before here come planes from the Hiryu. Some of the pilots that survived the battle on the American side seem to think that uh, at least one or two Japanese planes followed them back to the Yorktown. The Yorktown is attacked. She takes three bombs. Not one of the three bombs would threaten the life of the ship. But the one that hits next to the stack blows out the boilers the ship goes dead in the water. Damage control crews get the ship moving again within an hour. But another flight of Hiro's torpedo planes bear in for attack. Two of them are able to launch torpedoes that hit a midship. The Yorktown has the boiler rooms and the engines all in the center of the ship. That's the one spot that if a torpedo can, can breach that, you're going to lose your power. If you don't have power, you cannot fight your fires. You cannot expel water from the ship. So in terms of opening holes big enough to sink the ship, that's not the problem. The problem is where they hit. The Yorktown goes dead in the water. The commanding officer gave the order to abandon ship. We went over on those big lines that was dropped over the side. He was such a small speck and such a big picture. The Pacific is pretty large. And like the sailor's prayer of many years ago, 
Lord, thy ocean is so big and my boat is so small. Lord, have mercy on us. The last hours of the Battle of Midway seem to go well. Late on June 4th, 24 SBD dive bombers, 14 piloted by Yorktown refugees, lift off Enterprise to locate the elusive Hiru, the last Japanese carrier. They find and leave her ablaze and doomed. Meanwhile, back on the Yorktown, she's still listing. The next day, they decide to send a, a repair party back on, and they make a little bit of progress. As the repair crew of 29 officers and 141 men fight to save Yorktown, disaster is only a few hundred yards away. Commander Tanabe slips his I-168 past the four destroyers, screening the listing carrier. At a range of 1,200 yards, he launches his four 446-pound warheads at Yorktown. Even though the torpedo tracks are now marking his position for the American destroyers, he risks staying at periscope depth for the thrill of seeing his fish strike home. The first one goes off the bow of the Yorktown. The second one hits the Haman, which is tied up alongside the Yorktown, and the next two then go into the side of the Yorktown. Haman goes down very, very fast. As she's going down, there wasn't time to keep the death charges that are on the stern of all destroyers. The underwater explosion kills not only Haman sailors who are in the water, but uh, some of the Yorktown sailors that have been blown overboard. The next morning, just as the sun is coming up, it's obvious that, that she's, she's going under. Her sailors that are on board escorting the destroyers and cruisers still in the area, they line up, they salute, she goes under, she's gone. They were just a moment of, is this really happening? Is this really me? And I suspect that I had some company in that kind of a feeling and, and, and experience. The Japanese, with no aircraft carriers of their striking force, they have no choice but to turn and, and to go back and the, uh, the Battle of Midway ends then on the 7th of June, 1942. Commander Tanabe will write of the Japanese disaster at Midway. My sinking of USS Yorktown was small revenge for that loss. USS Yorktown has settled to the bottom of the ocean off Midway. The Japanese have departed, not realizing that the great name is already reborn. It is given to one of four new Essex-class carriers already under construction at the Newport News shipyard in the middle of 1942. Laid down is USS Bonham Richard, CV-10 inherits the Yorktown name. On January 21st, 1943, Eleanor Roosevelt christens the second Yorktown as she did the first. The new Yorktown is 7,000 tons larger and 60 feet longer than the first. Her flight deck is 10 feet wider. Despite the larger deck size, the increasing size and weight of aircraft keep her plane handling capacity to about 90. But her range at 15 knots 
increases from 12,000 to 15,000 miles and will make her a master weapon in the Pacific. The most spectacular change on CB-10 is her new commanding officer, Captain Joseph James Clark, always called Jocko, is a real maverick. He is an old school sailor, one eighth Cherokee Indian with a limp and an attitude. He was really a fighter and we were proud to go aboard his ship. And he told us that we were gonna go out there not to defend, but to attack. And that's what we did. CB-10's anti-aircraft armament reflects new respect for enemy planes. She now carries 12 5-inch dual-purpose guns, including eight and twin mounts fore and aft of the island. Her flak battery contains fast-firing 40-millimeter guns in multiple mounts and single-mounted 20-millimeter Orlikon machine guns. Yorktown enters service carrying five full squadrons. There is storage space in the hangar deck overhead for some 20 spare aircraft to replace losses. Yorktown's best news is the coming of the Grumman F6F Hellcat fighter. Now in place of the Wildcat, we have the Hellcat, made by the same company, Grumman. Everything is different. It's a bigger plane. It's a faster plane. The range has increased. We have six guns, and now we have 400 rounds per gun. The Wildcat ended the war with a kill ratio of 7 to 1. The Hellcat ends the war with a ratio of 19 to 1. Now, part of that is the fact that it's a better plane. But also part of it is the Wildcat fought the cream of the Japanese pilots. The Hellcat did not. On August 22, 1943, the New York town joins a strong task force out of Pearl Harbor to begin America's Pacific Offensive. Yorktown will be at the heart of a carefully planned campaign. Whereas raids in the past were for morale or to keep the Japanese off balance, from November of 1943 to the end of the war, what is going to happen is that the United States is going to determine where it needs to go throughout the Pacific to gain bases to get it to Japan. On November 19th, Yorktown is helping soften up Tarawa for a landing assault by Marines. But a returning plane causes chaos on the flight deck. He gave it the fuel, and it was just enough to... He crashed on top of the pilot that had just gone past the barriers. And then it was the biggest fire. Jeep. Jocko's voice, he could hear him. Get out there, fight that damn fire. I'm not gonna lose this ship. You get your asses out. Son of a... And we were afraid of him. <laughs> so he sort of got you to get out there. And that's, that saved the ship. In early February, she puts to sea as flagship of three carrier task groups targeting Truck Atoll in the Carolines. She leads the way, raking cargo and warships in the lagoon and destroying nearly 275 planes on the ground and in the air. The toughest targets create no special fears. Whether it was Kwajalein, whether it was Saipan, whether it was Marcus, whether it was Wake, didn't make any difference. Point was, this is where we're going, this is what you're going to do, and this is your target. That was it. 
you could see us in operation. I mean, when we were operating alongside another carrier, how much faster our planes would come in, get hooked up, unhooked, taxi past the barrier. It was just more effective. On the 30th of April, uh, the carriers are back off of truck to hit it one more time to be sure that it's totally neutralized. And then all of the movement from there then is in preparation for the invasion of the Marianas. Yorktown and her sister carriers move into the crosshairs as the Japanese move to a showdown. As the invasion of the Marianas begins on Saipan in June of 1944, Yorktown braces for a massive surface and air attack from the Japanese fleet. The Japanese plan is to fly attacks off nine carriers from distances too great for U.S. carrier planes to reach and then to land on Guam to rearm for new attacks from land. But part of the American plan was to keep enough planes over Guam. And when planes from the carriers tried to land, they would be shot down as they attempted to land. And the plan worked out exactly that way. Planes from Yorktown and the other flat tops, with two to one superiority in number of planes and far better trained pilots, massacre the Japanese attackers. The shooting was so good, even over Guam, that uh, Hellcat pilots were dropping their landing gear, dropping their flaps, trying to slow down enough that they could get good shots. The Japanese had 439 planes on board those nine carriers. They got back to Japan with about 20. It is four in the afternoon before Yorktown's rearmed planes take off under Michener's orders to hit the retreating Japanese fleet. The pilots know from their briefers that darkness and great distance make their safe return doubtful. So I left us. This was the, the whole fleet, I guess, because we must have had a couple hundred airplanes. With fuel tanks down to half empty, the first planes spot their targets and dive to engage. And it was just a wall of fire. I thought we were all going to be killed. The dive bomb would go over and they go down vertically and we go in and have to drop these things at about 200 feet. There were three of us pretty much in a row coming in on this, this thing. And I got as low as I could get without being in danger for a while. The Yorktown's planes help score hits on the carrier Zukaku, and a U.S. submarine sinks the carrier Shokaku. But now comes the long, dark, fuel-starved trip back to the Yorktown and the other U.S. flat tops. All along the way come calls of lost flyers going into the sea. On the way back, we could hear them, because they open the lines for the speakers. I'm running out of gas when you tell so-and-so. We can't find you, we can't find you. I only have enough fuel for five more minutes. This is Fox 41, latitude, longitude, and he was gone. I mean, it was just, it just went into the drink in the dark. All the way back, we were wondering how far it was how much fuel we had left, how many people were not going to get back that far. We were saying a little prayer that they found the ship. Yeah. We knew what they were going through in the darkness. We knew some of them personally, you know, and it, it, it hurt. He didn't turn on lights at sea because of the fear for submarines. But Admiral Mitchell, he said, turn on all your lights. Every ship in the fleet, turn on your lights. 
Nothing more than all the lights come on at once and it just looked like Broadway out there. So far as 50 miles away, they saw those lights. Otherwise, then, then, then hundreds of pounds would have been lost. And I don't know whether I finally settled into the water or whether the, the engine quit. But all of a sudden, it was quiet and I was on the water. Of the 11 Yorktown planes that made water landings, 25 pilots and crewmen are picked up by screening ships. Yorktown recovers 14 planes of other carriers on her flight deck. From June until August 1945, Yorktown fights and task forces tightening the ring around the enemy. In the Philippines, French Indochina, China, Formosa, and Iwo Jima. As Yorktown begins to launch raids against the Japanese mainland, a new threat comes. At the time, we were bombing uh, Tokyo, and the kamikazes were coming out all the time. I mean, first 30 days we were out, we were attacked maybe 26, 28 days out of that. I was directing an SXF fire plane, and all of a sudden, the plane stopped. It wouldn't move. And I looked up at the pilot, and he pointed to the sky and here come a kamikaze right across the flight deck. On March 18, 1945, off Kyushu, Yorktown's starboard signal bridge takes the ship's only bomb strike. Five men die and 18 are wounded. But the 15-foot hole in the hull doesn't take her out of the action. Then, off Okinawa, Yorktown's radios pick up news of a desperate threat from the sea. The Japanese are sending a force with their last super battleship against the U.S. fleet. The Yamato will sortie one more time, and that's on a kamikaze run. She will try to get to the beaches of Okinawa, beach herself, and, and fight to the finish. Yorktown and all the Task Force 58 carriers know that Yamato's 18.1-inch guns can strike from over 25 miles. They must stop the speeding giant before she is anywhere close to hitting the beachhead. Yorktown turns full speed into the wind to launch her torpedo and dive bombers to a critical interception. The American beachhead on Okinawa, clogged with shipping and equipment supporting the landed troops, is the target of the world's biggest battleship, INS Yamato. Her 18.1-inch guns are the most powerful ever on a warship. The huge battleship, sailing with an escort of one cruiser and eight destroyers, is tracked and located. Yorktown's pilots are among the first to dive in for strafing, dive bombing, and torpedo runs. Before we started the dive, they were firing. The, the ship was lighted from stem to stern with the explosive flashes. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that or been as close to anything like that as I was with that one. You don't want to drop it too far up because it may not work properly in the water. You can't drop it too far out, or it might not reach it, and you can't get in too close, or it might not be armed when it gets there. Yamato sinks under a storm of bombs and torpedoes. Many from Yorktown flyers, well short of reaching Okinawa. A cruiser and four destroyers also go down.
Through most of July and early August, Yorktown spends her days pummeling targets in Japan, including Tokyo, as the war nears its end. The last day of the war, the bombers that we'd sent in to bomb Tokyo got word just before they got there, the war was over. So they dropped their bombs in the water and it was headed back to the ship. And there was four fighters that was flying fighter coverage for them. They were attacked by 25 or 30 Japanese fighters. And eventually all four of them were shot down. When the remaining planes landed and they found out four fighters had been shot down, the fighter pilots were so mad, they started manning their planes. They were going after them without directions from their uh, CO. And so they, they were made to climb out of their planes. I just stood on the deck just weeping. I said, why, why after the whole war was over, these four pilots got killed and uh, we were attacked after it was all over. Yorktown is at sea providing security for the formal surrender on September 2nd, 1945. In what will be called Operation Magic Carpet, Yorktown employs her huge spaces to ferry some 10,000 soldiers and Marines back from the Pacific in two separate trips. On October 31st, 1945, Yorktown steams into San Francisco after her long war. Greatest thrill we ever had was saying, welcome home. And the people up on the top of the Golden Gate Bridge, there were thousands of them up there. They were blowing their horns. The girls were waving to us. We couldn't contain ourselves standing at attention. We were just so thankful. Thousands of people were there and they were so happy and we were so happy and there was a lot of crying and hugging and, and, and yelling and you know, it was, it was the most joyous time. Yorktown goes on to serve America over another quarter century. Major modifications in 1955 bring her an angled flight deck and modernized electronic gear to meet the demands of jet age warfare. Beginning in 1963, she performs in special operations off Vietnam, conducting anti-submarine patrols. After a brief return to duties in the Atlantic, she is struck from the Navy list on June 1, 1973, some 30 years after her launching in World War II. Yorktown finds a permanent home as the first ship preserved at the Naval and Maritime Museum at Patriots Point in Charleston Harbor, South Carolina. She is open to visitors throughout the year, and those always include the men who made her great. The ship, the ship, the Yorktown, is what put us all together and was an impact in keeping us together for this length of time. I don't know why, but, but I didn't want to leave the ship. Everything we did on that ship came out right. And what makes the ship things go right is teamwork. No matter what action we were sent into, we always came out smelling like a rose. The first carrier in Yorktown fought the war's most crucial sea battles, vastly outnumbered by a huge Imperial Navy. After she was sunk, a second Yorktown took up that great name to fight across the Pacific. It takes a certain kind of ship, a certain kind of man, to stand up to bombs, torpedoes, and kamikazes day after day and keep coming back to win.
On June 6, 1942, Tanabe Yahachi, commanding Imperial Navy submarine I-168, is stalking a crippled United States aircraft carrier, USS Yorktown. He wants revenge for losses inflicted by Yorktown and her sister carriers on the Japanese in the Battle of Midway, fought two days earlier. Tanabe fires one of the most devastating four torpedo spreads of the war. He stays at periscope depth long enough to watch the explosions tear into Yorktown. Watching his ship go down, Yorktown skipper Elliot Buckmaster makes his surviving crew a promise. That's all right, fellas. We'll get another ship and come out again. The first carrier Yorktown was a stepchild of two things, the Great Depression and fascism. President Franklin D. Roosevelt confronted both threats with one stroke. As part of the National Industrial Recovery Act, $238 million was set aside to build naval ships. The $38 million was for these two aircraft carriers, the Yorktown, and for the Enterprise. And the building process began at Newport News. Being the class leader, Yorktown was built first. President Roosevelt's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, was chosen to christen the ship. Yorktown launches on April 4th, 1936. Designated as CV-5, the fifth of a young United States carrier force, she is designed to incorporate all the experience and lessons learned from operations of the first four carriers. At 19,800 tons, Yorktown is barely two-thirds the displacement of the upcoming Essex class. Her 827-foot, six-inch length accommodates some 80 planes divided among fighters and torpedo and dive bomber squadrons. Yorktown's 32.5 knot speed allows her to outrace submarines and spearhead fast-moving sea battles. Her peacetime complement of 2,217 men will rise to nearly 3,000 in war. Through the late 30s, Yorktown is part of fleet war games. She is working out new tactics for aircraft carriers that up to now have been seen mostly as subordinate to the needs of the battleship line. In this period, there was a photo op, and it had the Enterprise, the Yorktown, the Ranger, and the Lexington in line. All they were doing was coming back to base after a fleet exercise. But that picture is what influenced some of the Japanese naval aviators to think about combining carriers as an independent strike force rather than to have it as was still the practice with both the British and uh, with the United States Navy of having the carriers basically there to defend the battle line or the battleships. When Hitler overruns Northern Europe in the spring of 1940, Yorktown transfers back to the Atlantic for neutrality patrols. Her planes are to hunt U-boats and surface raiders and alert British convoys, although they are not to attack the Germans. Yorktown is refitting in Norfolk, Virginia when the news comes that the main battle line of the United States fleet has been annihilated at Pearl Harbor. Yorktown races through the Panama Canal to join Lexington, Enterprise, and Saratoga, already in the Pacific. The orders from Washington, from Admiral King, were that number one, we need to use the carriers. We need to keep them busy. Number two, we need to keep the Japanese off guard. Number three, we need to raise morale. <laughs> 
To accomplish that, Yorktown and her sisters make pinprick raids on the Japanese-occupied Marshall and Gilbert Islands. Doing little damage, but suffering little, because the Japanese have not yet installed major defenses. But Yorktown's air groups find out quickly that some of their best planes are inferior to first-line enemy aircraft. The fastest Navy fighter, the Wildcat, has trouble catching up with Japanese dive bombers and torpedo planes, much less the speedy Zero fighter. In early May of 1942, the Japanese rushed to consolidate their string of conquests. They sent an invasion force through the Coral Sea, aimed at Port Moresby, the last stronghold of the Allies on New Guinea. Alerted through broken codes, the U.S. Navy moves to intercept. The American force of two flat tops Yorktown and Lexington is protected by eight cruisers and 13 destroyers. It has to stop enemy invasion transports escorted by three carriers, eight cruisers, and 15 destroyers. First, there's the invasion group, which has the transports to carry the force to take Port Moresby. And they're covered by a light aircraft carrier, the Shoho. There's then also a striking force which is made up of two heavy carriers, Shokaku and Zuikaku, both uh, Pearl Harbor Raiders. Yorktown is the flagship of Rear Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher. He takes his carrier into her first major battle. On May 4th, Yorktown planes find Japanese ships at Tulagi and sink the destroyer Kikazuki and three minesweepers. But the main forces have not made contact. They are looking for each other on the 5th, and both sides are surprised on the 6th not to find each other. But on the 7th, they do. Japanese air armada is flying toward our ships. Our planes are flying toward the, the Japanese ships. They actually pass in the air and from altitude. Both fleets can be seen. Although the American and Japanese fleets never see each other on May 7th, both are now vulnerable to attack from the opposing airborne squadrons. The American pilots strike first. Planes from both Yorktown and Lexington attack and sink the enemy carrier Shoho. Lieutenant Commander R.E. Dixon radios what will become an historic message. Scratch one flat top. American pilots managed to get some bombs on the deck of the Shokaku. That puts her out of action. The next day, May 8th, planes from the Japanese carriers find the Lexington and Yorktown. They're operating fairly close together, but not in such a way that the combat air patrol can cover both of them. And in fact, we're still trying to operate at that time with 18 fighters as the normal complement aboard an American aircraft carrier. Way too few. Captain Elliot Buckmaster skillfully uses Yorktown's high speed and agility, narrowing his target profile by spinning his 827-foot ship from broadside to stern on to approaching aerial torpedoes. Over half a dozen Japanese fish and as many bombs go wide of their twisting target. But the bigger, older Lexington can't maneuver like the new and agile Yorktown. 
and the Lady Lex pays the price. The Lexington takes a total of five bombs and torpedoes. She goes dead in the water. Internal fires and explosions set off by gasoline vapors finally doom Lexington. Yorktown fights as the lone U.S. carrier. Yorktown is hit by one bomb, which hits the flight deck, goes on down, explodes on the fourth deck. But the damage to the Yorktown is minimal. She's torn up pretty good inside, but again, nothing vital. A near miss lands close enough to the Yorktown that it opens the hull. In the final analysis, what we have is a tactical victory for the Japanese. They have sunk one of our major fleet carriers against only the loss of one light carrier. But not having sufficient cover in the air, it's felt that they've got to postpone. That's the Japanese word for it, not, not quit, but postpone the invasion of Port Moresby. They turn around and head back then to their bases. Yorktown is damaged. Uh, she is ordered to make her way back to Pearl. And all the way back, Yorktown will leave a trail of oil. This is about the same time Admiral Nimitz sent the order out to the Enterprise and Hornet to expedite to get back to Pearl Harbor as quick as possible. They know that the Japanese are coming. They've broken the code. They know that there's going to be a major push against Midway. Admiral Nimitz sends every available plane that he can find to Midway to augment the forces that are already there. There's a real question in his mind as to whether the damaged Yorktown can be repaired in enough time for her to get into the battle or not. Everybody knows that weeks of required repairs on Yorktown can never be crammed into three days. 